Welcome to Talks at GS. I'm honored to be joined by my friend Steve Schwarzman, who is the chairman and CEO and the co-founder of Blackstone. Uh, he founded the firm, as most of you know, with Pete Peterson back in 1985 with $400,000. And he's turned it today into certainly the leading, you know, no hold barred alternative asset manager, but one of the leading asset managers in the world with $550 billion of assets under management. You've written about your storied career in a book that I recently read and really enjoyed, um, <laughs> What It Takes, Lessons in the Pursuit of Excellence. And so let's start by just welcoming Steve and thanking you for being here. Great. So I want to I want to start because I learned some things about you in the book that I you know I didn't know I I I didn't know about Schwarzman's curtains and linens and so I want to go back to the beginning where you start in the book growing up in the suburbs of Philadelphia your father ran a family business Schwarzman's curtains and linens and you started working there at ten years old for ten cents an hour um, and in a preview of your future life and this was a very poignant story at the beginning of the book you talk about how you went to your father and proposed that he expand the business. So talk a little bit about that story and how that conversation went and, and how that shaped you a little bit. Yeah, I was, um, um, actually I asked my grandfather for an increase to 25 cents. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, Stephen, you're not worth 10. Uh, <laughs> so, so I guess these Schwarzmans, uh, you know, sort of have a certain uh, objectivity. Um, and, and the store looked like, um, sort of bed, bath, and beyond, except there was no bed, bath, and beyond. And I'd watch all these customers. I said, this is like a good thing. So I went to my dad, probably when I was somewhere around 13, um, and I said, hey, dad, a lot of people in this store, and um, why don't we take the store all over the country? Um, and uh, I thought it was like a no-brainer. And he said, he looked at me, and he said, Steve, I... I don't want to do that. And I'm trying to figure out why he didn't want to do that. So then I decided tactically, maybe I should retreat to just Pennsylvania. So, so I said, Dad, let, let's, if you don't want to do that, let's just open them all over Pennsylvania. He said, I don't want to do that. I said, okay, I'm figuring, maybe he doesn't want to travel. So I said, let's just open six, How about if you were in Philadelphia? six or seven <laughs> stores around Philadelphia. And he said, I don't want to do that. And I said, Dad, why, why, don't you, why don't you want to do that? And he said, because I'm happy the way I am. I, I have two cars. I have a house. I have enough money to send you and your brothers to college. That's really all I want. And I, I couldn't like, take that on board. Why would that be all you want? But, but it was. He was a lovely person and super smart. So it was hard for me to imagine how a smart person wouldn't want to do that, because it was just right there, right? Bed, Bath & Beyond showed that, that it was right there. But, but I learned that not everybody's the same. Not everybody likes to change what they do. Most people are quite happy uh, just, just being in whatever space they're in, even if they grumble about it. Uh, a bit, they, they, they don't really have the gumption to go out and change. So it was, um, I always loved my dad. Um, I didn't love him any less after that, interestingly. But I realized I was, I was just like different than he was. Well, you, 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 you were different. Another story I liked in the book, and obviously I won't have time for all of them, but, but this one was one that was great. You're applying to colleges and you got into Yale and you were waitlisted at Harvard. Yep. And so you basically picked up the phone and you went right after the admissions director at Harvard and tell that, tell that story. That was pretty scary. Uh, <laughs> I, they didn't have cell phones yet, right? Uh, and, and devices of almost any kind. Uh, so, so to make a phone call, you had quarters in your pockets and they, they had cell phone, uh, uh, pay phones. Pay so uh, the only pay phone I had uh, availability to was at the gym. Uh, in my high school, so I, I, you know, I got the number from information for Harvard uh, admissions. So I, I called and I said, Dean, whatever his name was, and, and you know, he's the head of admissions, and they put me through. So he picks up the phone, and I said, uh, uh, you know, I'm Dean so-and-so, uh, my name is Steve Schwarzman from Abington, Pennsylvania. I'm on the wait list. 
and it would really be terrific if you would admit me. <laughs> so he says, how did you get my number? <laughs> I said, I don't know, it's just in the phone book, right? Uh, he said, but nobody's allowed to talk to me who's, a, who's an applicant, I don't talk to applicants. I said, well, apparently that's not true. I mean, you're, you're talking to me. Uh, and, and uh, you know, uh, I, I said, I think I'd be a real asset uh, for Harvard. And he said, I I'm sure you would. Uh, but um, unfortunately, uh, we're not taking anyone from the waiting list. Our yield is higher than we thought. So wh where else have you gotten in? Uh, I said, I, I got into Yale. Uh, he said, well, that's a lovely place. I'm, I'm sure you'll have a very good time. I said, I'm sure I'll have a good time too, but that's not why I was calling. Uh, and and I, I said, I think it's really gonna be in your interest to take me. He said, why is that? I said, I think I'm going to be very successful and that would be good for Harvard. So he said, he said, that would be good for Harvard, but I, I don't have any flexibility. And meanwhile, the sweat is pouring off of me. This is like dialing God. <laughs> the, the dean of admissions at Harvard, are you kidding me? Uh, and you know, I, 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 I hung up the phone, and you know, I'm like looking at myself, I'm soaking wet, and I failed. Uh, and I went to Yale, and he was right, I had a lovely experience, and so, so uh, actually, funny thing happened probably 25, 30 years later. He called you? Uh, no. What happened is one of the members of the Harvard Corporation was in uh, who does some work for us uh, at Blackstone. And you know, I told him this story. He said, well, was that Dean so-and-so? I said, yeah, it's, it's my memory. Uh, and he said, well, he's a really great friend of mine. Would you mind if I told him this story? And I said, no, no, tell him the story. So three weeks later, I get a letter in the mail from the former dean of uh, Harvard uh, uh, admissions. And it says, dear Mr. Schwartzman, uh, you know, my friend so-and-so uh, talked to me about your situation. Uh, and he said, I remember getting your phone call uh, uh, in, in 1965 uh, because I never got a phone call like that before or since. Uh, and regrettably, I've been following your career in the press. <laughs> <laughs> and every time you do some other amazing thing, I keep saying, I completely blew it. <laughs> so he said, you have my apology. He said, the problem uh, when you're in my kind of position is you never know uh, with the young person which one's going to really work out or not. And, you know, he said it was Yale's gain because I'd given Yale a lot of money and hadn't done it to Harvard, so, you know, so that, that was that story. It's a funny story at the end of your life. I can assure you when you're 17, this was not a funny story. <laughs> so after college, after college you landed your first job at, uh, at DLJ, and then went on to serve in the reserves um, during the Vietnam War, and then after serving, you did make your way to Harvard because you went to Harvard Business School, yep. which you initially hated. Yep. Um, so talk a little bit about what cemented the fact that you wanted to go into finance? What was the moment you said, I'm, I'm going in that direction? I'm very bad at math, so it wasn't a normal thing. I joined DLJ, I was untrained. This is another thing, Goldman's been a leader at this. We've tried to copy you know, some of the stuff that, that's been successful in training. When I joined Lehman, we had no training. You just like- you just started. You just got a desk that probably had that at Bear Stearns. Uh, you had a desk, you didn't know much, you tried not to blow yourself up. Uh, and so I had no training and all I did at DLJ was try and have no one give me an assignment. <laughs> I must have used more deodorant than anyone in New York. I was so nervous all the time. I, I didn't even know what a stock was, okay? Uh, so I went to business school and you know, I, I learned that stuff and I interviewed with two types of organizations, um, uh, financial companies, because I was at one, and advertising companies, because I thought that would be interesting. I was rejected at Goldman, uh, and you could probably tell why, you know. <laughs> you know uh, but, but, uh, By the way, I got rejected at Goldman when I interviewed right. out of school. Well, you got twice. rejected twice. Yeah. I only, <laughs> you know, I was smart enough to only apply once. <laughs> <laughs> 
I applied a third time. <laughs> but, and you got it. But, 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 but I knew they really didn't want me. Anyhow, so, so you know, I, I got 17 uh, at, um, uh, at Lehman. I went, went into uh, finance. Um, <laughs> I didn't even know what I was doing because I'm not a natural, you know, for, for filling out spreadsheets and doing that kind of precision work. But I, I could always see uh, patterns. And my first job interview at college uh, after, you know, it was just the interview process to get a job after college. Somebody interviewed me, uh, I forget which company, and they said, what do you want to be? Uh, and I said, I want to be a telephone switchboard, which apparently put the man off. Uh, and, you know, I, I, he said, what are you talking about? I said, I said, I want all these feeds of things that exist in the world, and I want them to come in, I want to whirl them around, and I want them to go out differently than they came Amen. in. I said, that's what I want to be. Guy says, you're not for us. <laughs> 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 now that I'm older, I realize, you know, that was a little bit of an unconventional thing. Well, I thought, unconventional answer, but it's, it's, it actually is a pretty good answer. I, I thought people were transparent. I didn't know, right? <laughs> they, 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 they sort of have shields. I, I'm pretty transparent, as you can see. So, so you, um, you join Lehman Brothers, and your career gets off and going, but I think obviously one of the most pivotal, pivotal relationships that, that became hugely important to the direction of your career, the establishment of Blackstone, was in your second year at Lehman, Pete Peterson became chairman and CEO, and you developed a real bond with him. Yeah, it was very interesting. Uh, uh, Pete was 21 years older than me. He was an accidental uh, CEO of the firm. It was, you know, the firm got in trouble, and, and, you know, the old partners, you know, I call them like the Dukes, they, they all hated each other, didn't trust each other, so they figured they'd take the new guy who was just hired, who didn't know anything about finance, and make him the head of it, and then they would control him. That was... Didn't quite work that way. <laughs> not a good assumption. So they didn't end up controlling him. So, but he knew nothing about uh, finance. And uh, so, so uh, I was a second year associate. The firm had been in trouble. And, uh, and so Pete went around with a guy named George Ball, who was Deputy Secretary of State, uh, joined Lehman uh, to find money to save the firm. To give you some idea of how midget size Goldman, Lehman, and Morgan was, in 1972, $7 million of capital saved Lehman Brothers. So Pete uh, sent a note out to everybody. This is why Lehman was so different than Goldman. Imagine this, um, that he sent a note out to everybody and uh, all, the, all the partners and associates saying, okay, we've sort of had a mess now. How should we, um, what, what strategic plan should we have to run the firm? Uh, and at Goldman, you would have gotten a lot of responses from a lot of responsible, very smart people. At Lehman, <laughs> nobody responded to the CEO except me, because I, I didn't get the word that that was politically incorrect, right? So I wrote him a strategic plan. It was, you know, it was sort of, you know, big corporate finance business, big money management business, whatever. So he called me down because he was lonely. <laughs> Yeah, like nobody was down to see him. So I went down. He said, oh, you seem like a very smart young man, blah, blah, blah. Tell me about your plan. So, you know, I danced my way through the plan. Uh, and, and then he said, that's great. He said, we should work together. Uh, and I said, that is a very, very bad idea. <laughs> and he said, why is that a bad idea? I said, I heard you don't know anything. <laughs> <laughs> and as a result, you ask for a regular assignment about five times more stuff than you need because you're trying to figure out what you're doing. I said, I am a second year associate. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> so why would the two of us work together? <laughs> I, I said, why don't we wait until at least I learn what I'm doing <laughs> and uh, hopefully you'll learn what you're doing and I will give you a call when I've learned, and I'd be glad to work together. I'm just not capable of doing that now productively. So he's sort of like, <laughs> who got, is this kid? Right, who is this person? So I left, 
Uh, and about uh, two or three years later, I called him. And I, I, I said, I'm ready. I said, I heard you're only asking two to three times as much information as, as you actually need. So you've made improvements, and I'm ready to go. And we started working together. And um, you know, I became one of the youngest partners uh, you know, at the firm. Uh, so, you know, it was, it, it, we, we had a great time, and he was um, a guy who um, was very smart, uh, summa cum laude process thinking. I was uh, quicker. Uh, and you were, produ you were a producer. You, you, oh, you yes. Were, you, 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 there are a number of big deals that when you were younger, and this is, this is even when I started, which was, you know, which was, which was 10, 15 years later, you know, if you produced, and by the way, producing was a very independent thing because in those days it was kind of open field. Yes. You built your own relationships. You turned it into an opportunity. It was, you know, you were a producer. And that's, yeah, that's how I, the world, that's how I the was, world I was very productive. And, and so the two of us, he, he, he had been uh, Secretary of Commerce and also uh, President uh, Nixon's economic advisor. Kissinger was the uh, international advisor in the White House. And uh, so uh, Pete knew everybody. I knew nobody. I mean, I'm just you know just a nice middle class person from Philadelphia, and uh, so so you know he'd sort of turf him up, and you know I'd skin him, uh, and and you know uh, so so we became like the Bobsy twins, uh, and you know we'd go to meetings, and you know he'd bring somebody in who was the head of a corporation. I'd figure out what we can do with them, uh, and then. You know, we developed a really great relationship at the beginning. People, um, you know, sumas and magnas think differently. They're, I call them process thinkers. So they can think about anything and they'll eventually come to a, um, a good resolution. Uh, but sometimes it takes so long for them uh, that, you know, I can usually do the exact same thing, but like, right. you know, just know what it is. And, and so Pete gave up after a few rehearsals on merger deals. He said, where are you going to open? I said, I don't know. i got to look at them. You know, see, see if they, you know, you, you feel the situation. And um, as you know. And, and so, you know, after a few of those, he gave up. And, you know, I sort of did what I wanted. And, and he brought people in. And, you know, we always agreed on, on basically everything. And, and so, you know, we worked at, at Lehman together until Lehman blew up. He was thrown out. Uh, and somebody else was in, and then that guy who was the f who had almost destroyed it in 1972 accomplished his objective of destroying it uh, in uh, 1984, and I sold the business. Uh, you know, it's like a 36-year-old guy uh, to American Express, Express yeah. uh, because this guy had destroyed 100% of the capital in the firm, and the way these firms die is they all do a lot of financing and repo, and when your counterparty you know, recognizes you have no equity, they pull the plug, the firm collapses, and meanwhile, the firm was making a fortune yeah. in corporate finance and its regular uh, activities, and Pete went off uh, you know, a year uh, earlier and started some kind of small venture capital business, and I left a year after we sold it, so it was two years later, and we just wanted to work together. You know, the only thing we, we forgot as entrepreneurs and you'd appreciate that from the platform of Goldman, uh, is there were no M&A boutiques. They didn't exist. So we didn't even know that. We just thought it was Pete and Steve. We could do anything, right? Because we did. We did this huge volume of M&A work and other things. And um, so we figured you put out your shingle, the same clients just give you work because you're so remarkable and wonderful and pleasant and funny, how can they not? The answer is, they didn't. They were scared, I didn't know this. They were scared to give some no-name firm, even though we were not no-name people. We, we, we didn't understand that, and you know, we sent out like 500 letters and to people we knew, they weren't even strangers, and we got no business. So if you ever want to have the crap scared out of you, send out 500 letters and make pretend they weren't lost at the post office. <laughs> and you sit around in your little crappy office of 3,000 square feet uh, with no secretary. Pete had a secretary. He deserved a secretary.
I answered the door for two years, um, you know, and we got nothing. And so, so when, so when did you when did you decide to raise some funds? Well, at the beginning, yeah. we, we had a plan. This is a piece of advice for you if you ever do something. Just don't do what everybody else is doing <clears throat> and think it's wonderful because you're doing it. The world couldn't care less, actually. You care. You think you're wonderful. The world doesn't care if you're in an area that's being well-serviced. So what we did is we sat around and said, okay, we're going to start a business. Let's start something unique. Um, and, 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 and that's our distinctive thing. So we, 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 you know, we, we, we looked at a three-part plan. First, go into the M&A advisory business. Why? We knew it. It requires no capital. Second, we wanted to go into what was then called the LVO business, which is the private equity business. That was the best business on the planet, uh, except investing in Google in the first round. Uh, and, you know, I had advised uh, the, the, several of the firms that existed in private equity. There were only several of them, uh, and nobody wanted to even underwrite them. I had to get special dispensation to do underwritings for for, for some of these guys because they thought they were like nothing. Uh, and the third uh, piece of what we wanted to do uh, was, was to wait for periodic changes in finance. And uh, if there was something that was happening that was like an amazing opportunity uh, that we wanted to do that, uh, we decided we'd only do it in two circumstances. Uh, the first is if we could hire somebody who was a 10 out of 10, uh, because then we know we would crush it, because we wouldn't know that field. And the second is if that business generated intellectual capital, so it made our existing businesses much stronger. If it didn't meet those two tests, we wouldn't do it. And, and, and so we took that strategic plan and we mailed it to everybody. And, and nobody gave it. Uh, you know, it was amazing. Uh, and I thought it was a really good plan. By the way, it's 34 years later. It was a really good plan. We're still doing the same plan. Yeah, it was a really good We've plan. We've never changed. We just are executing the same thing. And we wait around until there's something really neat. So good, even I can't screw it up. So you have to pass up little things and only do really, really big things. So, so that's, that's, um, that, that was our plan. And you know, it, it ends up now, you know, they have different names for this, uh, intellectual capital production. This is like data. We've been doing this since 1985 because knowledge is power in finance. Everybody thinks the same, more or less. I mean, we, we, you all test well. You, know, you all go to good schools. Uh, you all get well trained. So how do you win the game? You have to, you have, to have knowledge other people don't have. And, and to do that, you have to produce uh, that knowledge and then you have to figure out how do the pieces fit? Uh, you know, how do you see something in one area that tells you what's going to happen in another area? And if you have that and you can mine that, and now they have names for this, data mining, okay? It's just information and seeing patterns yeah. which lead you uh, to, to, to other opportunities. Let's shift gears and talk about the macro a little bit, what's going on in the world. Um, you've been a key advisor to presidents in both parties, including the current one. You have enormous ties to China um, over a long, long period of time. And so you've also had an impact on these conversations. Talk a little bit about trade, about the U.S.-China relationship. You know, give some insight into how you see that unfolding in the years ahead. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, we've been in the middle of uh, a lot of the China stuff over the last uh, two and a half years. It started with a conversation with President Xi, which is really pretty amazing. Uh, uh, we were at Davos and, um, uh, you know, there were 17 Chinese officials on one side of a table and 17 non-Chinese officials. Another was a lunch. And so I'm just sitting next to Klaus Schwab. So President Xi looks at me and he says, Mr. Schwarzman, uh, tell me what's happening with the new government in the United States, uh, which hadn't started yet. It was starting two days later. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, well, we've had a surprise election. You know, the person who won uh, 
wasn't expected to win. Uh, and um, he said, why did, why did you win? I, I said, because we have an unhappy country and they wanted to change. And, and one of the areas of unhappiness uh, is you know, people's uh, incomes uh, and the jobs leaving the United States and, 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 and diminish uh, wealth uh, for you know, probably as much as 40% uh, of the population and they're unhappy and they become populous and uh, they're, they're, um, uh, they wanted to change US politically, but they also uh, want uh, what happens with populism, it has nothing to do with the United States. They get angry, and, and when they get angry at domestic people, like they have, business community, wealthy people, financial people, it uh, doesn't solve their problem. So then they get angry at somebody who's, who's, who's a foreigner, and I said, they're going to get angry at you because you're where the wealth has gone, you're where the jobs have gone, and and you know, you're, you're gonna have to change what you're doing. And so we had this discussion in, in front of, you know, like 34 people of what he, you know, I said, here's what you gotta change. And I figured, I'm just being helpful. And I, I said, don't be misled that this has anything to do with Donald Trump. I said, this has to do with unhappy people in America. Yeah, and I said, at some point, he won't be president. Uh, but that doesn't matter. I said, I said you're going to be facing an ex-president who's going to be carrying the same burden from our population. And he's going to want China to open, uh, you know, do something on intellectual property, all the normal types of things. So, so it's fascinating. He said, um, he said, you know, I didn't know all of these things. I said, well, we didn't know either before this election. Everybody thought something different about the foundations of America, and now we've learned that's not where America was going. And I said, don't blame your own people for not knowing. Every pollster in America was wrong. Was wrong. Right? So, you know, you're, you're getting it right now from me because I know it. And he said, well, if that's the case, uh, we, we are going to have to make some significant uh, uh, economic adjustments uh, in our country. And then he asked me to call the new president and tell him what he said and that kind of stuff. So this started me on some incredible uh, adventure. Um, you know, I was just like minding my own business. I was a person at a dinner, a lunch uh, rather. And so, so these discussions have been going on. And you know, of, of course, in China, they, they have, you know, sort of, um, Hardliners who don't like to change anything sure. because why not? They've you know they were growing at that time, you know like at nine ten percent, and we were growing at one point eight. Uh, so if you're growing at five times somebody else, why would you change? And and then you had uh, the reformers who, who knew they would have to change. So so it's 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 been a, a bunch of false starts and uh, so forth. Uh, you know how much opening, how fast. Uh, the U.S. keeps changing its views. Uh, the Chinese keep changing their views. Uh, you know, I, I, I've been like in the middle of this thing. It's, it's um, you know, you think you're almost there and then one of the two sides pulls away. It's like, you know, it's like deals we've all done. Uh, this one's just unfortunately uh, visible to the entire world. Yeah. And it affects markets and other things. And I, I think uh, it's inevitable that um, you know, there's going to be change X technology, uh, and, and, and there'll be a trade deal. Uh, there probably uh, could be one uh, relatively soon uh, on, on this first um, uh, tranche, uh, and I think there's good faith uh, that there will be a second tranche. Well, well it'll, be, it'll be interesting to see because the changes are real, um, and... Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's gonna be a process, it's gonna be a continuing process for, yes. for a number of years. It's yes. gonna be more part of the fabric of you know, how we think about what's going on you right. know, day to day. Um, well, one, one piece of advice for you all um, that um, comes not just from the, this situation but from others that we've all worked on, uh, we the older people, not old, older, uh -huh. uh, that when there's something that's doable, 
Um, I usually should hit it um, because time, time wounds all deals. Yeah. Uh, and so the deal that ultimately will be made, um, uh, you know, it isn't as easy for some of the participant as a deal you could have made a year and a half ago. Yeah. And, and you know, you learn this in your career that there's certain times where, you know, um, if, if you're able, you should just bang it and get it done. It's like a bond deal in, in a market, which I learned, um, you know, that's fallen apart. You don't price the bond, you know, right where it would trade that second because by the time you get back from a pricing committee, it's already 25 basis points down. Yeah. Price it 25 basis points ahead, you'll get the deal done. If you go back again when it's 25 points down, you're going to need another 25. Yeah. So just to wrap up, I'm going to do a quick lightning round, okay? Okay. And for quick questions, quick answers. Leader you most admire? Jack Welsh. The thing we'd be most surprised to learn about you? Jeez, I can't even tell you. There's so many of them. <laughs> tell us one. Uh, I, I like to collect uh, Egyptian artifacts. That's a good one. The last great book you read, other than your own? Uh, yeah, I did that 20 times, <laughs> drafts. Um, I, I read a book, I forget the name of it. I think it's called Accidental Presidents. Uh -huh. And uh, it's, it's a book about the eight uh, vice presidents who accidentally became presidents. Became presidents. Yeah. And it was fascinating because some of these people are like compromised candidates who, who don't, the presidents don't even like. And some of them, they, they, they don't have, they don't even share a political philosophy. And you know, some, some of these presidents have died within a few weeks of getting their job. So you actually had a person that really wasn't elected in the same way, uh, prosecuting a completely different agenda, some of which uh, have changed the course of the United States in a very positive way. Steve, thank you. Really appreciate you spending the time with us.